Hello everyone, this is Ron Carson speaking, and on behalf of the good people at Avtech, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar entitled, Critical Considerations for Successful TDM to IP Migration. When it comes to this topic, industry experts agree that it is a matter of when and not if utilities will make the move. The benefits of IP are well known, but at the same time, significant changes in technology can be scary. Today we're going to hear from Kevin Sumrall, Vice President of Utility and Public Safety Sales at Avtech, who's going to share the benefit of his years of experience in the utility markets. Very good. Thank you, Ron, and, and good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Sumrall. Uh, I've been involved in the, uh, I'll do a quick introduction, I've been involved in the, uh, in the, the design and development of voice communications for uh, almost my entire uh, professional career. Uh, predominantly starting in inter international call center markets, then moving into financial trading, and now uh, being involved in both radio and voice uh, telephony communications in uh, the utilities industry. So I've had a lot of experience from both the uh, development side of uh, the technologies uh, that are utilized within the industry, as well as uh, now the deployment and implementation of those systems. So just a quick overview of the agenda today. Uh, the idea here is, um, uh, just to provide some insight to some of the things that we've seen in the TDM, the, IP, the TDM to IP transition. Uh, just a little bit of look at some things about disaster preparedness and what we refer to as disaster avoidance. Uh, just pre-planning and making sure we have things covered and understanding why IP benefits us there. Then we'll move on to failover and redundancy and we'll look at how IP benefits us when it comes to having duplicated infrastructure or distributed infrastructure that allows us to uh, move things out of a central environment, which we often see in the TDM world. Next, we'll discuss uh, network portability and login mobility, which is really the ability to move around a network. Once we've moved our resources into the network, how do we gain access to them uh, across a, a wide area environment? And then lastly, we'll just talk about interoperability, integration, and flexibility, and how IP has simplified the world of, of integration and made it much easier for us to be able to tie different technologies together into a common infrastructure. So when we look at the utility industry, we really consider that as, as critical infrastructure. And what does that mean? And it's really the basis of all things that keep us as individuals, our homes, our families, our friends, our society, and our economy uh, continuing to operate. Um, the unfortunate reality is without the utility and the critical infrastructure environment that we so heavily depend on, um, it really uh, establishes the foundation for all other things that we do within our economy and our society. <clears throat> and the, this is really off of the Department of Homeland Security website, but it really states it very well in that without having the utility industry or the generation of energy and distribution of energy as the very foundation of everything that we do as a society, all other uh, infrastructures will cease to function. Uh, without that foundation, without having the core, the dependency that we have on the energy industry, um, all other components of our society will ultimately collapse because they, we do not have um, energy and energy distribution. There was actually a book written uh, called One Second After, which was uh, by William Forstgen, and it really talks about an EMP environment, but it really has the same result when we look at what happens when you lose an energy supply and the breakdown of society. So when you look at this, uh, what we consider critical infrastructure, it is absolutely a necessity uh, that it not only continues to operate, but from Avtech's perspective and our perspective is the ability to communicate with either your partners, uh, within your infrastructure uh, between substations and, and primary distribution points uh, and keep those lines of communication open. So just a quick introduction to TDM and, and most people that are on the call have probably already been involved in TDM at some point, uh, but as a quick overview, TDM was developed very early in the 1870s and it was really driven towards mass communication in the teletype industry. How do I get all of these teletypes to a, a, a remote distance uh, and simplify the cabling. Originally, it was individual cables for individual means of communication. So TDM was developed as a, a means of multiplexing or tying all of that together on a common infrastructure. It had 
TDM technology had its day. It's, been, it, it's had a long run of well over 100 years. The unfortunate reality is that TDM technology was founded and based on a uh, dedicated platform. So it, it required a, a very hardware intensive infrastructure to be able to support connectivity. There, were a lot, there was a lot of proprietary cabling. So the technology was based on a somewhat dated chipset uh, or, or technology. Um, it has become more and more obsolete over time. It's getting very difficult to obtain parts. So although the systems have provided a, a solid infrastructure for many years, the technology itself that it's based on is starting to be phased out. Another component of the TDM technology was that <clears throat> since the infrastructure was a centralized core in a disaster recovery mode, one required duplication of that infrastructure. Being centralized, everything was contained in one cabinet. When you look at multiple uh, locations, it required some high level of, of uh, connectivity between them, which was typically dedicated T1 circuits or some means of connecting these systems together. And as I stated, these technologies have typically become more and more uh, obsolete over time and are being phased out. So when we contrast that to IP, IP is a fairly new technology, uh, considering that TDM was developed in, in the 1800s. When we look at IP, it was really developed initially by the Department of Defense uh, as a means of connecting multiple remote locations together. And if we look at where it is today, it is considered one of the most pervasive technologies that's been deployed um, through mankind because almost every, uh, every activity that occurs today has some type of connection to a network. If you look at everything from our banking to how we do business, people working from home, uh, the distributed model within, certainly in the utility industry where we talk about all the SCADA information that's being brought back from remote locations, how everybody communicates today. There's, uh, I, I was just recently reading an article where over 80% of voice communications today is being handled over IP-based networks, and they, they anticipate that within the next 10 years that there will probably be no um, really back backhaul infrastructure that's based on a TDM technology. The other benefit is when we look at IP, it is completely scalable where in the TDM world we were limited to a hardware-based model that had inherent limitations as to how much capacity we can add to a specific either card cage, cabinet, building more cabinets to fit more capacity. In the IP world, um, we don't really have that limitation. It really comes down to capacity in the backbone. So it makes it much easier for us to scale. Uh, and today, you know, having uh, gig E or 10 gigabit links between locations is, is, is somewhat typical. We also look at things like the standardization of, of protocols. And when you look at things like session initiation protocol and SIP telephony protocol, um, there are many technologies that are founded. When you look at digital mobile radio, the DMR uh, technologies that are deployed today, they use SIP as a foundation for signaling. And then they enhance that with other uh, messages that are not typically utilized in the SIP domain. But it allows you for a much more stable infrastructure because you're really working from standards based instead of moving into the, utilizing proprietary infrastructure, which was very common in the TDM world. Um, and then lastly, when we look at IP, the, one of the, the biggest benefits is certainly having the ability um, to relocate components and push them outside of the central core. Uh, TDM forced us to have a, a uh, single point of failure because we had a cabinet located in a building. Loss of that cabinet meant we more than likely had some cold standby infrastructure located at another facility, which took time to bring up uh, and was probably tested on some regular basis, but it still takes time to activate. Where IP now gives us the benefit of being able to move components outside of that central core into remote locations and move those out closer to its, its point of contact for things like communications, whether it's telephone access or radio access, but get it outside of that, that centralized uh, environment. So really when we look at it, what are the common practices? What are the things that we typically worry about when we're going to deploy an IP infrastructure? And, and some of the most common things that we typically see is, do I have a private or an enterprise-based network? Do I put critical communications on my IP infrastructure? 
We have many customers that typically will do one or the other. Obviously, they, many customers still today will deploy a private network uh, because their network infrastructure may not be ready to support you know, things like quality of service um, or it may not support based on our next bowl of multicast. So do you isolate your traffic or do you leverage your existing network? Obviously, there's a return on investment by leveraging your existing network, and many people today uh, do utilize their core networks for this. And again, voice being a time critical uh, application requires that it has a much more stringent set of rules when it comes to deployment on IP networks than your typical standard data infrastructure. So that's just something to consider. The other part is unicast versus multicast. Unicast is a point-to-point -point signaling protocol um, that uh, is, is transportable across an IP network. But multicast becomes much more efficient because if there are multiple endpoints listening to a common audio signal, it minimizes or reduces the amount of traffic that's being put onto the network. So using multicast requires an end-to-end -end configuration from the source to the destination to make sure all points in between are capable of passing that multicast traffic. That's one of the key stumbling blocks that we often find with networks is how do we manage um, and how do we uh, supervise the network and make sure and ensure that the network is built for multicast traffic. So that's just a consideration to have when you look at deploying IP infrastructure on your existing network is can I support multicast and am I managing it from end to end so that I don't have quality problems or, or drop packets or block packets or filter packets as I progress through the network. Quality of service versus bandwidth. Uh, when we look at infrastructure today, typically quality of service is managed one of two ways. It's either managed by the application by saying, hey, I'm a voice application, I'm a high priority, or the network has to identify a specific set of packets and say, yes, I understand that this is a voice packet and I'm going to flag that. Another me means of doing that versus instead of quality of service is potentially using bandwidth. And many of our customers have the capacity within their network infrastructure where quality of service isn't exactly necessary because they have enough bandwidth capacity where they don't anticipate any type of, of uh, overloading or saturation of the network. So that's just one of the other key concerns. And certainly when you talk about real-time applications like, like voice technology, um, one of the key concerns is certainly latency on the network or delay. So those are things to look at end-to-end, -end. where are the components going to be located, what's my typical delay across the infrastructure, and how do I manage that? Again, real-time applications tend to put a lot more demands on a network than your traditional data infrastructure, your traditional data applications. So really, just take a snapshot of your entire network. You really have to think this through from the beginning to the end to make sure that everything in between is prepared for uh, real-time critical communication infrastructure or applications and the ability to pass those uh, without having um, uh, errors or without dropping packets that will cause uh, loss of syllables or, or drop calls or things that could impact communications on your network. Looking at IP and understanding the benefits of uh, that it yields to us for um, disaster avoidance. I always prefer to call it disaster avoidance because I want to be, I want to be prepared for the event. I want to have pre-planned it. I want to understand what my options are and have the infrastructure prepared to be able to support that. So when we look at um, disaster events, you always look at it from multiple levels. So you have the most simple is a component failure. So how do I protect myself against a component failure? How do I protect myself against a network segment failure? How do I protect myself against uh, loss of access to a building and what may that look like? And then ultimately the, the worst uh, catastrophic state is what happens when I lose part of that infrastructure? Let's say I lose a data center or uh, there's a significant impact in operation, whether it's a fire or flood or some other type of event. And those typically are what we utilize to plan what is our um, uh, distribution of our components going to look like? Where are we going to put our parts? In the TDM world, again, we were in a central infrastructure where all the cabinets, the connectivity to all of our radio or telephone connections were all placed in one basket. And then the loss of that basket ultimately meant we had to move and 
fall over and you, to a backup site that gave us an alternate location. IP provides us the capability of pushing those components. Instead of having line cards in a backroom infrastructure, we can now use things like gateways that allow us to convert those technologies at the points that the, the technology exists. In many cases for radio infrastructure, we can take for a legacy uh, conventional base station repeater, we put a, a two or four wire gateway in front of that repeater, which allows us then to convert that to an IP connection. In many cases, we can make that a redundant connection. So we can have two interfaces to the same radio, or we can have two separate distributed gateways that let us have a primary secondary connection. That allows us to have redundancy in the event that we have a location or a component failure. Um, so that's just part of that whole process of looking at how do we decentralize the core and move things out to the edges of the network so that we have minimal impact in the event of loss. The other benefit of IP is everything being connected to an Ethernet infrastructure is it's common cabling, yes, but also um, we no longer have a physical dependency where in the past when a TDM type environment we had to use, uh, you know, typically custom proprietary cabling to connect things. You had to bring uh, cabling into a punch block and then connect that to a line card. In the event that that line card failed, you had to rewire uh, the components. And today, because we're using gateways, we have an ethernet connection. And those gateways can typically be set up as redundant connectivity. But we still have a limitation, which is the physical interface from the central office for some of the legacy technologies like POX lines, uh, T1 PRI type circuits and things of that nature. So you have to think about how do we decentralize those, what's my backup plan, and have two gateways deployed with common connectivity and then swing lines over, which makes it much easier than, um, you know, the old days where you actually had to physically uh, disconnect and reconnect and flop lines over. So IP gives you much more flexibility. And we talked earlier about locating the interfaces closer to the point of origin. And really what that ultimately means is by moving things out to the edges or putting them in our data centers instead of our dispatch centers, it gives us the ability to have connectivity across a wide area network. Um, in many cases, that eliminates the overhead that the, the cost that's incurred for leased line infrastructure and copper connectivity. We eliminate that and move things into the network much quicker. Once it's in the network, it gives us the ability to move it to any location and provide access uh, from anywhere across the wide area network. So once we've decentralized our core and we've moved things out to remote locations across our network, the other aspect is looking at, so what do my failover strategies look like? How am I going to implement redundancy? The benefit of IP uh, it certainly allows us to be able to have multiple devices connected over a network with a primary IP address and a, a ghost IP address, if you will, that allow us to have things that stand in a hot standby. So these could be set up as primary secondary so that we can fail over uh, from a, a, um, a primary point of contact to a secondary that allows us to have a hot standby. Or we have the option of doing load sharing where I can take, you know, a piece of uh, my interface and apply it to one location, a piece of my interface to the other location, and I can then make those um, hot st uh, standby of each other so that in the event one of those fails, the other can assume uh, that infrastructure. The benefit of doing it this way now, the way that, that IP allows itself to be uh, scalable, is that can be very granular where many devices can be uh, fail to multiple uh, sources. So in, in the case of the systems that we deploy today, many times we will have um, uh, not only a single backup site from a primary secondary, but you can have up to 10 different layers of failover. So that allows you to move your connections around the network uh, so that in the event you lose a facility or in the extreme case we lost two connection points, we have the ability to move those over to other locations as well. You know, dual network connectivity is another key component. The devices that are critical to communications, um, anytime we, we sit on a network, we don't want the network to be a common point of failure. So most devices today will have redundant or dual NIC interfaces that allow us to connect to multiple network segments. In the event we lose a segment, we have a backup path that we can follow to maintain connectivity. <clears throat> 
and the new interfaces, all of the advanced digital technologies that we deploy today are all what's considered wireline or Ethernet based protocols. So this allows us to connect, and again it goes back to that model of, of a distributed uh, architecture, it allows us to connect your voice communications platform, let's say that man-machine control component, which would be your consoles, across a wide area network and ultimately have redundant connectivity into uh, your uh, mission critical communications, whether that's an IP PBX, uh, things like a, a Cisco call manager or a, a, an Avaya um, CS1000 type platform, or into your radio infrastructure, whether that's P25 CSSI or it's, it's a SIP type infrastructure into an IP PBX, you now have access anywhere across the network. And because it's wireline interface, it allows us to have uh, your primary and secondary backups into not only the primary but into multiple locations depending on failover for the RF controllers in a radio system. One of the other key benefits, and this is very common not only in the utility space but also in public safety, is maintaining a level of local autonomy in the event that a worst case a catastrophic failure occurs where I lose my entire network connection. In the event that I lose that connection, what is my fallback going to look like? So today, instead of using the wireline or along with and parallel to the wireline, many times we will connect wireless control stations. So we will use a, an RF control station interface that sits in the background and allows us to access the same channel or talk group um, on a digital infrastructure as well as having local gateways at that facility for telephony connections. So even in the case of a distributed Cisco uh, call manager infrastructure, we still have the capability of bringing in POTS lines to a local um, uh, dispatch center, which will allow us a worst case scenario for that facility to be able to maintain its own operations in the event that we lost access to the main network connectivity. Even though in many cases it's redundant, as a worst case scenario, we provide that secondary level of failover. Once we've distributed across the network, it, it benefits us to be able to access that information from anywhere within the infrastructure. So utilizing profile-based logins, the individuals, much like your PC when you log on a network today, it doesn't really matter where you are, voice communications, once it's in the data environment, allows us to have the same uh, mobility across a network. So using profile-based logins, the user interface and interaction becomes very consistent regardless of location. In many cases, you're using the same infrastructure just from a different point of entry. In the TDM world, we had a cabinet that was connected to consoles. In many cases, in a disaster in environment, we had to go to a secondary site and we had to hope that all of that infrastructure was still available. In many cases, the DR sites were actually scaled down versions of the primary dispatch centers. In the IP world, since we've pushed everything outside the central core, you no longer have the risk of losing the primary core. So by having distributed components, you now have the ability to access that same infrastructure from a different location. So it's really transparent from the console component and how you communicate into the network it's transparent from the dispatch or the communications perspective. Everything is available to you regardless of where you access the network. And that's no different than the boxes themselves, whether they're gateways, uh, whether they're a, a direct IP connection into a, a, uh, an IP PBX uh, or um, uh, some other device, everything can be moved around the network because they're IP addressable. So in the event that you have um, loss of a tower site and you have a secondary location where you could set up those radios, when, in w one of the most common instances of this is in the public safety domain where they use uh, mobile command vehicles and they will typically either have wireless or ethernet connectivity to that mobile command vehicle. Once that vehicle plugs into the network, it has complete access. So in the case of utilities, some of our customers actually have remote backup sites utilizing substations where they place um, a, a console component and allows them access into the infrastructure in the event that they had to evacuate um, the, uh, the dispatch center. But again, very flexible infrastructure and just allows you to move uh, very freely. 
And, and one of the last components of this is, is really once we're in the IP world and accessing everything over a common network, it makes it very easy to do software upgrades. Uh, in the TDM world, we always had to do uh, EEPROM changes, so you were constantly swapping out chips. Every time there was a software update, somebody had to physically uh, go in and, and touch that device. Today, things like um, uh, software updates, screen updates for your, for your consoles, uh, software updates to the remote gateways, uh, software updates to any of the components that sit within the network is much easier because typically your software is pushed to those devices and they're updated automatically. In most instances, they're updated without actual having to a restart. Um, in the TDM world, you typically had to reboot uh, or restart a line card interface. In the software world, it basically just assumes and adopts a new image and it's automatically available to you. So. Uh, it makes it much easier to maintain. One of the bigger benefits is certainly from a maintenance perspective is VPN connectivity and allowing people to be able to access, especially from a maintenance perspective, over VPN connection. Uh, so if over using, utilizing a secure connection, you can modify the system, look into trouble logs, uh, error conditions remotely, uh, as opposed to having to do that uh, physically being on site. So time to restoration is much quicker now. So next, let's, let's talk about interoperability, integration, and flexibility. Um, you know, some of the key components of uh, the, the whole IP domain is the fact that things have moved more into the software environment than they have. Uh, they've moved away from the hardware-centric uh, uh, components. The benefit of that is that it, you know, developing software is certainly much more cost-effective, much more efficient, and it allows us to modify and evolve at a much more rapid pace than hardware development. Um, prior TDM systems all utilized hardware infrastructure. And anytime you had to modify that hardware in infrastructure, uh, those connections all had to be maintained. That the technologies had to communicate with each other. And it was a very uh, laborious process to upgrade. So many times, if chips went obsolete in the hardware domain, you had to replace the card in order to maintain connectivity. Well, in the IP world, because it's moving towards a, a software-centric environment, it allows us to make changes much more rapidly. Um, it, it also al allows us to do um, a sort of a common core base because many of your technologies today, because they're using open standards, things like uh, the P25 CSSI protocol, a lot of the DMR protocols are all using a similar type uh, foundation as SIP. So you're using a SIP protocol, and then you have some enhanced capability. So that allows us then to have a much more stable base of software than has typically been available in the hardware domain because everything had to be custom. The other benefit of moving more towards the software domain is as new technologies become available, it makes it much easier to integrate. Um, we're seeing a lot of enhanced PTT, which is really PTT over cellular as either a primary or an alternate backup. And again, that's, that's purely a decision that the customer makes, but being software oriented and having a modular type environment that allows us to scale in the software domain provides the opportunity to be a little bit future-proof and allow us to develop interfaces into multiple technologies that can be supported simultaneously. So if you're running legacy infrastructure, if you're running uh, digital mobile infrastructure, whether it's P25 or, or digital mobile radio, such things such as, as Moto Turbo or uh, a Tate, D, a Tate DMR, Tate Net DMR, those infrastructures are supported simultaneously because they're really just software interfaces. It's not hardware dependent. It makes it much easier. And D, LTE is, is the next phase where we understand that voice migration may ultimately adopt LTE. And again, there's some confines around that for quality of service and prioritization and things of that nature. But for, for now, you still have the ability, because it's software-based, to integrate as those become available. And some of this we've covered already, but when you look at an IP network and you look at the scalability um, and the ability to put more applications on a common infrastructure, it certainly allows us to scale and adopt technologies much more uh, much more quickly than has, has ever been available. The TDM technologies typically, because of the backbone and the communication of the way that they, um, that each component had to communicate with each other, 
didn't afford the opportunity to look at new technologies. Many times you'll have what's called a hybrid type application where you'll have uh, a TDM system which has an IP overlay on it. The downside with that is you're still dependent on that TDM infrastructure and you really haven't moved into a decentralized environment. You're pretty much con contained still uh, and de very dependent on that core to be available to you even though you've, um, you've morphed and now allowed some IP connectivity. But getting into a fully distributed uh, IP type environment really affords you the ability to utilize uh, a less hardware dependent system, more software centric, uh, it certainly simplifies the integration to new technologies um, and allows you to grow the system over time. Um, we, many of our customers will start with, uh, you know, one specific business unit and then reutilize that same, uh, those same components for processing and add on a second unit. Because it's uh, basically components in an IP world uh, do not rely on common processing, common memory, com common timing. It's typically timings derived from the network. Many times those systems um, uh, will, al will allow us, the, the new IP infrastructure allows us to add components very easily without taxing the system because all the components basically become independent islands and they're only communicating, sharing typically a, a, um, uh, a common multicast stream for its transmit and receive audio, whether that's radio or telephone. Okay, so we've kind of walked through the different components and the high level, and, and I really just at this point wanted to kind of touch on just a summary overview of what we covered. There's a lot to IP infrastructure. Um, my goal was for today's session to stay out of the acronym soup uh, of IP and to really just approach it from a very high level. Um, so really, just in summary, if we look back, you know, what are the key things that we worry about? Certainly, as you understand in the utility infrastructure, it's critical to the welfare of the U.S., to our economy, and to us as, as, as a society. Um, so the goal here is to, when you design systems, whether they're commun communicating with uh, your field uh, personnel, whether you're communicating with your distribution partners or your transmission uh, supply partners, all of that lends itself to the mission critical environment of maintaining and sustaining a highly reliable, highly resilient infrastructure and the ability to communicate, uh, obviously, when the chips are down. And we certainly understand in the utility industry, ice storms, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, all have a significant impact on that. And the last thing you need is the inability to communicate. So when we look at, you know, to just looking back now at TDM technologies, we understand that TDM uh, had served its purpose. It had a, a significant run over, over well over 100 years. But ultimately, the technology that it's based on, the chipsets, the very components that, that make up that capability have become obsolete. In many cases, TDM systems now, you have to go to the black market to find chips because they're very expensive. They're no longer manufactured. And typically when that happens, people will, con will buy them up as quickly as possible so that they have some surplus so that they can continue to uh, protect themselves in, in the event of a failure. But unfortunately, reality is there's a finite amount of those components that are available. They will ultimately impact the ability to maintain a TDM-based system. And then when we look at IP and its real inherent value, especially in a uh, disaster preparedness and a critical infrastructure environment, it really, the geodiversification, the ability to move things out of a centralized core, to leverage your existing network infrastructure are all positives. And again, it's just being prepared and understanding the redundancy and the resiliency of your network and making sure that you have the, uh, the I's dotted and the T's crossed in maintaining the ability to support quality of service, understanding the latency and delay across your network, and understanding, you know, how am I going to support multicast in an environment where maybe many components need to monitor and engage the same traffic simultaneously. Planning for redundancy is, is typically sitting down and understanding what are the failover type scenarios, what are the things I need to, I need to look at, and just understanding what do I need to be prepared for, how am I going to distribute, how am I going to access my channels in the event or my, my PBX in the event that, this, that I lose this component or I lose that component. So it really just becomes a game of, of, it's a shell game. Okay, how do I understand where things are going to fail? How do I protect myself against that? 
the benefit of complete network-wide access. Having all uh, your resources available in the IP domain allows any location to be able to access that regardless of where they're coming in. So instead of having a dedicated connection to a centralized component, you basically have a very broad modular environment that allows any position or any communications tool to access those resources that have been distributed across the network. So it really makes the transition from a primary dispatch center to a secondary dispatch center very fluid uh, and very easy on a dispatcher as they now can move and maintain their a, a consistent look and feel uh, on how they uh, how they manage business. Flexibility to change. I mean, obviously, change is the biggest impact, and we look at wireline or Ethernet-based infrastructure, IP integration as being a means of allowing us to evolve over time. Again, because older technologies did not evolve and support many of the new advanced technologies, IP, the software-centric nature of it, the ability to interface to multiple technologies simultaneously really affords us now the opportunity to be future-proof and allow us to evolve with technologies much easier than having to do custom uh, interfaces into new technologies as TDM did in the past. And then lastly, just looking at your backward and forward compatibility, migration is a very difficult process, whether it's the human aspect of not, allow, not, not really adopting change well, being resistant to change, it's inevitable. We're going to have to deal with it. Things are moving into the IP world, um, and that, that's a given fact. Um, so maintaining connectivity to the legacy environment, using things like gateways to bring uh, our POTS lines and, and T1PRIs in, as well as then migrating over to a, an IP distributed IP PBX or a digital radio type technology. Um, IP really affords us the ability of, for a very clean, clean transition, interfacing to the old while migrating to the new and simplifying that process for us. Okay, so our first question, uh, Kevin, um, it's kind of a broad one, but uh, how do you deal with the increased security risk that comes with IP technology? I, I think a lot of that is dependent on the availability of, of current infrastructure. Um, the way that most of our utility customers work today is they will provide uh, their standard P. PCs and, and their standard network infrastructure, and we become just an application that runs on their enterprise. In many cases, there are things like Active Directory integration where you can pull um, you can pull logins and things of that nature. But typically, with with us, we're we're accessing resources that are available internal to the network, and it's very rare. Uh, that will have uh, a, a communications system of this severity that's connected to uh, an outside uh, network. Um, I'm sorry, uh, like an internet type. We don't typically deploy over open, uh, commercially available, accessible, or uh, external uh, internet access, if you will. So in many cases, we're actually running on a customer's network, utilizing their PCs that are, that are adhere to the internal security requirements of that specific organization. How about the people aspects of TDM to IP migration? Uh, specifically, how, excuse me, I'll try that in English again. Specifically, how steep is the learning curve for people that have to support it? I'm going to assume this comes down to the maintenance side of things when it, when it comes to supporting a system. From our perspective, it's become much easier to manage uh, a digital environment than it has been to what I always call the black magic uh, of analog technologies. Um, in, in the IP, you know, when we get into the data side of ones and zeros, it becomes very easy to track things and to be able to understand where the process broke. Uh, we're we were just involved with one that was a, a bit of a network challenge to us, and ultimately, you know, by putting filters on, we can actually log events that occur. We can see where traffic is passing, and you can very quickly isolate where um, the environment tends to break. In the analog world, it took quite a bit of having to listen to different pieces. It was very difficult to log things in the analog world the way it is in the digital domain. One of the other common practices we're seeing is that typically uh, the uh, radio and IT groups are now beginning to merge. So you have a lot of cross-pollinization of RF technicians and engineers that are actually now becoming uh, pseudo IT folks and IT folks that are now having to support radio infrastructure. Uh, 
And because it's becoming more and more IP-based, um, we're seeing a, a, a very significant adoption uh, of that practice where um, uh, we're starting to join forces where IT and, and RF infrastructure are becoming one and the same. But I, I, from my perspective and what I've seen, in, certainly in the utility industry, um, IP has been very readily adopted uh, by both sides, both the IT folks uh, taking voice communications. Many utilities are moving into the IP PBX world anyway, and this is just another application that uses that same infrastructure. Okay. Um, this one's a little more um, product-oriented, but does your solution offer push-to-talk capabilities? Well, I, I guess the question is push to talk over what technology. So I'll, I'll just touch on that at a very high level. We do support push to talk capability over different types of technologies. That is, uh, let's call it the enhanced PTT, things like Sprint Direct Connect um, or the old uh, Nextel IDEN capability. And again, different technologies have different types of interfaces. Uh, so we support the gamut. When we look at the technologies we have to integrate with, we support enhanced PTT, which is your cellular, cellular type technologies. Uh, we also support uh, your conventional radio technologies. We support the digital uh, mobile radio environments, things like um, uh, Moto Turbo, TateNet, DMR, uh, P25, DFSI, CSSI. We'll get into acronym soup. But yes, we do support PTT over many different types of technologies. OK. Uh, I think what will wind up being our last question of the day. Um, I think we've touched on this throughout the, uh, the presentation, but I'm not sure if we've addressed it you know, as head on. Um, the question is, is migration typically done as a forklift move or can it be done incrementally over time? That, that's a good question. And when I look at the benefit of doing IP migration, um, it's very rare that we actually do a forklift. One of the most critical pieces that we get involved with from an impl implementation perspective with our customers is actually planning that migration. In many cases, we have um, a, a time-based migration strategy where we will deploy in parallel to an existing system. Uh, and whether that's from just a simple console perspective, whether we're connecting to analog radios uh, based on an obsolete uh, console product, or we're migrating over into an advanced IP, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an advanced IP-based radio technology like digital mobile radio, um, and migrating off of the conventional we do manage that process of being able to provide connectivity to the existing legacy infrastructure while at the same time providing access uh, to the, the new implemented advanced technologies. Uh, and that includes things like being able to patch uh, your old technologies to your new technologies. And again, for us, the key is get things into the IP domain as quickly as possible, and it becomes the great equalizer because we can take each of the individual languages, make them a common language that's easy to mix, and then go back out and transcode on the opposite ends to those radio technologies again. So it makes it very easy for us to provide a very smooth, clean, uh, and uh, managed migration strategy. OK, and with that, that uh, does conclude the, the Q&A portion. Uh, Kevin, did you want to say any uh, closing remarks just before we wrap things up? I sure would. Thank you, Ron. And I appreciate uh, uh, everyone taking the time today to uh, to listen to me ramble on. Uh, I thank you for uh, you know the opportunity to speak with you. And certainly, feel free to uh, to contact us at any time. We're here to help. And obviously, we've we've done this for quite some time. Aftech, being a 30-plus year company, has a lot of experience in helping people migrate from uh, one technology to another. So please feel free to reach out to us, and and uh, we're here to help.